Welcome to Ataxia 201 from Johns Hopkins Medicine. I'm Elizabeth Tracy. And I'm Wei Yi Mu, a genetic counselor at the Johns Hopkins Ataxia Center. Thanks so much for joining me today. It's wonderful to be here. I'm very interested in this idea of ataxia and genetics. So before we start on that, would you mind first telling me how does genetic testing work? Sure, genetic testing can be done on a blood or saliva sample. Um, it is often done in the clinic. So if you come in for an appointment, you do your blood draw that day, or it can be done remotely now. Things are, uh, since the pandemic, a lot of labs have moved to remote saliva sample testing. So you get a kit in the mail with a cardboard box, you spit into the tube, or you do a swab, and then you mail it back to the lab. Wow, that sounds like a real advance. Is it as accurate as the blood test? Yes, many people wonder whether it's just as accurate, and it is. How about the expense? So genetic testing used to be a couple thousands of dollars, even into the 10,000s. People who have had a taxi genetic testing about 10 years ago or more were faced with large bills for the testing. Thankfully, things are much better now. Things are uh, more labs have come on the market now, lowering the price. So genetic testing can still be costly, but it's usually on the order of a couple hundreds of dollars to the low thousands. And many insurances are covering genetic testing now. Good news. Let's go then to the genetics of ataxia. And so first, if you don't mind, just defining ataxia. Sure, ataxia is a symptom of incoordination. It can be caused by many different things. Some causes are genetic, some causes are not. So we're gonna talk about the genetic ones. And so is it possible for someone with ataxia to be the only person in their family with the condition? That's true. Someone can have a genetic ataxia, but not have any family history. Sometimes, and many times people think about genetics as being inherited conditions. And there are many people in our ataxia clinic who have family histories of ataxias. Their mother, their grandmother, maybe an aunt or uncle have the same condition. In these families, it's more obviously genetic, but we also have many people who are found to have a genetic cause for their ataxia, where they're the first person in their family to have ataxia. And I always get the question of, how could it be genetic? It seems like no one else in my family has it. And in these situations, it's often because there's a new genetic change that has happened in the person who has the ataxia, or it's a combination of genetic factors that were sort of like hidden in the parents, but passed down to the person who has it. How many different types of genetic ataxia are there? Mm, so right now there are more than 50 genetic ataxias that are named spinal cerebellar ataxia. However, there are even more genes, hundreds of genes for which ataxia is a symptom of that underlying genetic condition. So there are many, many genes now and more genetic tests that are available to try to detect those genetic ataxias. Hmm. So does this mean that somebody who presents with ataxia should undergo genetic testing? What usually happens is that when someone has ataxia, their neurologist makes a determination of first what tests they should go through initially, and they will evaluate for non-genetic causes of ataxia, especially causes that are treatable and actionable. And either after that first round of testing or if there's an obvious family history of ataxia, then that person with ataxia gets referred for genetic counseling. So um, I do see people who don't clearly have a genetic ataxia, but we're trying to assess whether it's genetic just to make sure we're not missing any potential identifiable causes for their ataxia. And what are the pros and cons of being genetically tested? Yeah, there are many pros and cons of genetic testing, and um, every person can make a decision for themselves whether that makes sense for them to be tested at that time. Some of the pros of going through genetic testing include getting a more specific diagnosis for your ataxia. For many people with ataxia, it's really frustrating to know, uh, not know what's causing your symptoms, and many people have been dealing with their symptoms for years or even decades, and so knowing finally what your what you've been fighting against, what you've been dealing with, can feel important to people who have it. For a small percentage of people, there can be treatments that are different based on whether they have a genetic ataxia. Some genes that cause ataxia respond better to certain categories of medications. And there are other symptoms that go along with certain genetic ataxias that 
the doctors, the neurologists can monitor for. For example, there's some genetic ataxias that can cause vision issues or heart issues that may need to be monitored over time. Oh, so, I can definitely see why it would be important to know that. I imagine that people who are diagnosed with a genetic ataxia are probably very concerned about their children. Absolutely, and that's one of the potential cons of the testing. It can be a pro depending on how your family works, how you communicate, what's important to you. But for some families, one of the hardest things is telling your children that they might be at risk for the same thing you're dealing with. Um, I want to be clear that not all genetic ataxias are passed down from parent to child. Some of them actually stay within one generation. Um, so it depends on the gene. That's kind of good news, isn't it? Yes, yeah. and many people with ataxia wish that it just stays with them and that no one else has to experience that. What does it mean if a genetic test is negative? Mm, so genetic testing sometimes, or actually in the majority of times is negative, meaning that we didn't find any answers in this round of genetic testing. When we do ataxia genetic testing, we often do one or two genetic tests to capture all the possible genes that could cause ataxia in that person. When all of the testing is normal, we tell people that we don't know for sure that it is a genetic ataxia, but we can't rule out the fact that it's genetic because not all genes for ataxia have been discovered yet. So actually in 1993, 1993 is when the first gene for ataxia was discovered. And that was a collaboration of neurology plus families with ataxias. And since 1993 up through now, 20, more, 20 or so more years, there are hundreds of genes learned about for ataxia. And the pace of learning new genes is picking up. So new genes get found every year, and some of those genes relate to ataxia. So if your testing is normal, it doesn't mean that it's not genetic. It just means we haven't quite found the answer yet. Talk to me about genetic counseling. What exactly is that? That's your role. Yes, as a genetic counselor, my role is to provide education for families about the genetics of ataxia, and more specifically to answer questions for them about, is this genetic? How can I get genetic testing done? I provide um, coordination for the logistics of the genetic testing, and I help explain the results to people and their families. And I am the person who deals with the family communication aspect. How do I tell my relatives? Should I tell my relatives about my genetic diagnosis? Are they at risk? What should they do? Genetic counseling is a process of making genetic information relevant to the people that are affected by it, and also to help them adapt to and live with the genetic condition. How can people go about getting genetic counseling if they think they need it? Genetic counseling is available at our ataxia center through myself and other genetic counselors. People can go to their ataxia center and usually genetic counseling is part of the services. If you need to find a genetic counselor outside of your local clinic, you can go to the National Society of Genetic Counselors. There's an online tool to search for a genetic counselor that is local to you. There are also online telemedicine genetic counseling services available in every state, so genetic counselors are more accessible than before. Excellent news. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much. This is wonderful to have this conversation.